Parashat Shi'ur. Hope everyone's doing well. This year is dedicated Le'ilui Nishmat Ne'ima Bat Eliyahu. And Levi Ben Dina. For Levi, what was Michael? Levi Ben Dina. May Hashem give him a full refuah shalema refuah nefesh. Okay, and we are back. Okay, Parashat Pinhas, Ot Aleph. We're doing the first Ot of the Zera Shimshon in Parashat Pinchas. So he asks a very interesting question. The Zera Shimshon brings a Midrash, and the Midrash says as follows. Gadolash, okay, so what happened? Let's, let's recap from last week to this, this week coming up, okay? <laughs> okay. So what happened was, Bil'am Harasha wanted to, when you say it really hard, it makes him like, in Gehinam, he really feels it. When you say Rasha, rather than saying Bilam Rasha, you know, it doesn't really. Bilam Rasha tried to curse the Jews. And he was unsuccessful, completely unsuccessful. Therefore, what did he do? He came to Balak who had hired him and he told him, listen, you can't curse the Jews because they're not cursed. But I can give you a suggestion as to what you can do and then just... Lay back and watch as God punishes them Himself. The God of Jews, Sonezima, He hates um, impurity and He hates, um, what's the word? Incest, immorality. So why don't you release your daughters as if they're like wild animals, quite literally. Release your daughters into the Jewish midst and have them seduce the Jews into doing Averot. And that's what they did. Including the king himself. He sent his own daughter and they seduced the Jews into Ovde Avodah Zarah to, to worship idols. Once they started to worship idols, Jews started dying left and right. A plague came out and the Jews were dying. In fact, by the end of the parasha, it says, 24,000 Jews died. All the cursing, none of that worked. Bil'am wasn't able to do anything. At the end of the day, who was responsible for the death of the Jews? The Jews themselves. They started sinning, they started doing immoral things with, with the Midianite women. And 24,000 passed away, unfortunately. In the midst of all this, the head of the tribe of Shimon goes and grabs one of the, the, the uh, uh, um, what's her name? Kozbi Batsur, the daughter of Tzur, right? And uh, they, were, they, were, they were together. Pinhas sees that there is a plague, the Jews are dying. He takes a spear and he penetrates the spear into both of them. Killing them both on the spot. As he does this, he picks up the spear, he shows it to all of Am Yisrael and basically says, who's next? And then it says the Magafa stopped. The plague stopped, the Jews stopped dying. The story has different sides to it. The Jews wanted to gang up onto Pinchas and they wanted to punish Pinchas. Who, how dare you? Who are you to punish the Jews? You, who made you judge and executioner? Yada, yada, yada. Hashem chimes in, HaKadosh Baruch Hu comes and says, Back off! Okay, it's because of Pinchas that all the Jews were saved. Heshivet Hamati. What does the Pasuk say? What does the Pasuk say exactly? Heshivet Hamati Ma'al Bnei Israel, That he returned, so to speak, took away my wrath from Bnei Israel. That I had such kinah, I had such um, wrath and zealotry towards them. And he avenged me, avenged my honor. Therefore, et periti shalom. Therefore, I, I have given him my covenant of peace, of shalom. That was basically a gift for, uh, a gift that was given to um, Pinahas by Akadosh Baruch Hu. That's where. The last week's parasha ends off, and this week's parasha starts off with, right? At Beriti Shalom. You have a question? Just quickly, was it Pinchas that kind of lived through Eliyahu Hanavi, or 
Well, we're going to see that in this, in this, in this right now. The Midrash says, Gadol HaShalom. Shalom is extremely great. Shaniten lefi nehas she'en ha'olam mitnaheg ela b'shalom. The shalom that was given to Pinhas was the greatest form of shalom because the world cannot survive, it cannot go on without shalom. Veha Torah kula shalom. And the Torah is entirely made up of shalom. Ve'im ba'adam min aderech. And when you see a person coming from a journey, what do you say to them? Shualin lo shalom. They say shalom to them and they, you, they ask them about their journey and basically say that it was hopefully be shalom. Vechen shacharit. And also in shacharit. Shualin lo shalom. In the morning, you say shalom to a person. It's actually in halachot of when exactly you can say shalom to a person in the morning when you wake up. Can you do it before shacharit? Can you do it after shacharit? After brachot? And it's, it's special that it's brought down that way. And then at the end also, by Shema Yisrael, Chotmim, how do we end the, uh, the, 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 the prayers of Arvit? Haporeh sukat shalom alenu. Hashem should give us sukat shalom. Hatifilah chotmim shalom, the tefilot themselves. Every day, when we pray the Amidah, three times a day for men, one time a day for women. Well, how do we end the tefillah? How does our tefillah, the Amidah, end? Oseh shalom im romav. But what's the... Oseh shalom is the closing part of the tefillah. What's the last tefillah of our Amidah? Right. Sim shalom tova uvracha. Last thing we end off is with shalom. In the tefillah also. Brikat kohanim. The blessing of the Qanim, which is a midor, right to law. It's a, it's, a, it's a biblical law, it's a biblical commandment to all Qanim, even today, to bless Am Yisrael, ends off with shalom. Right? It ends off with shalom. No, no, not the baracha. Yevarech Hashem Yishmerech, actual baracha. Ad kan leshono. Until here was the lashon of the Midrash. This is Midrash Rabbah, Bamidbar Rabbah Chaf Alef Alef. Okay. The Kashe. says, now it's difficult. There's a difficulty here. Demar Atzal Lomar Gadol HaShalom Shelintel Lefinhas. Why does the Midrash say the Shalom that was given to Pinahas was a great Shalom? Why? Bechi Shalom Zem Meshune Mishara Shalom. Was the Shalom that was given to Pinhas different than the other Shaloms? It says, Hashalom, the shalom that was given to Pinchas, was a great shalom. Was it different than any other shalom? Vahalo, isn't it true that right afterwards the same Midrash says, She'en ha'olam itnaik ela b'shalom, the world runs on shalom, and when a person comes from the journey, you say shalom to them, when a person wakes up, you say shalom to them. It continues on that same path. So, how are you telling me that the shalom that Pinchas got was a much different or greater shalom if you're ending it off by saying, and we give shalom to someone when they come from the journey, we give shalom to someone in the morning, we do... Uh, what is it? Is it different or is it not different? And if it is different, what's different about it? It's different. Right? Why is the... One sec, one sec. We'll, we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. So everybody got the question. Question we got. So what's the difference between this shalom that Pinchas got? Be'yesh lomar. So he begins to answer the question. Damrin al midrash, Because the Midrash says on the Pasuk, Ve'yasem lecha shalom. Hashem shall give you peace. I won't call it peace anymore, I'll say shalom. Because it's not the same. Hashem should give you shalom. Right? Rabbi Lazar ben Oshel, Rabbi Lazar kapar omer. Gadol shalom, shalom is so great, Shafilu Yisrael ovdim avodah zara, even when Bnei Yisrael are worshipping idols. Ve shalom benehem, but there is shalom between them, kav yachol. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, 
So to speak, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Ein hasatam nogea benehem. The Satan has no jurisdiction within these people. Shenemar, as the, there's a pasuk, aval, but, mishenechleku, when there is, uh, when there is a machloket, when there is strife between the Jews, then, then there is chas shalom destruction. Have a shalom, snoa machloket. Shalom is great, and machloket, strife, is hated. Just to elaborate on what this Midrash just said. You know, in the time of David HaMelech, even in the time of Shlomo HaMelech, there were wars that the Jews fought in Eretz Israel. However, when you look at the history of the wars, even the successful wars that we had, which were many, we still had injured Soldiers, we still had injuries, we still had people that fell at war, right? Things happened, it was wartime. However, in the time of Achav, for instance, King Achav was an extremely wicked king. In the time of Eliyahu Navi, I mean, you read, you read the stories of Eliyahu Navi, you read the stories of the Navi, King Achav, I mean, like, it, it was bad. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was like, to, to mention one thing, like, his wife, forget, forget him. I mean, oh my gosh. She was, uh, beyond gone. She, 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 she literally had, she would, she was murderous. She had someone assassinated just for their vineyard because Achav wanted the vineyard, right? At the end of the story of Achav and his life. But Achav was very, very wicked. He had the Jews worshiping idols left and right. He was proven wrong by Eliyahu and Navi multiple times. And the Navi says at the end, he still went back to his old ways. Achav was extremely wicked. However, not only were they successful in war, they had no casualties. Nobody was hurt. But in the time of David and Melech, they would go to war, they had casualties, they had people getting hurt at war. What gives? Right? Like, you read these stories, honestly, sometimes when you read Navi, you're like, dude, seriously? Like, why? Some of the stories are like twisted. Right? You see certain things, then you read the depth in them and you realize. In the time of Achav, why did he, why did he not have any casualties or anybody hurt at war? One reason. People were worshipping idols. That's a given fact. Amisrael was idolaters. They were following King Achav and his orders. However, there was one thing that was going for them. There was shalom. They had shalom with each other. They had peace with each other. There was no lashon hara. There was no backstabbing. There was no, as Persians say, cheshmam cheshmi. Like, oh, what, uh, what does he got? Jealousy and everything. What does he do? I'm going to do better. What does she do? What she do? I'm going to do better than that. You know, should we get into the whole wedding scene right now? Or are we... Are we should we, should we get back into the, you know, it's done, the wedding scene, okay, no more in Cabo and stuff like that? Oh, Mexico, Cabo, no, no, okay. They're like telling them, people are getting stolen over there, don't, don't matter, you know. Still, still, they ain't getting stolen from by the beach, because that's where the wedding is, right, okay. So it's like, it, 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 that's not what was happening in the time of Achav. But in, unfortunately, in the time of David Amelech, that was what was happening. It still was present. Jews weren't getting along. So that's why the Midrash says, Gadol Shalom. Look how great Shalom is that you could be literally in front of Hashem's eyes worshipping another God. Okay? You could in front of Hashem bow down to a piece of wood and say, You're not God, Chas Shalom. This is God. And Hashem will say, Satan, you have no jurisdiction, leave them alone. They're going to go to war, and they're, 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 they're going to beat their enemies. Imagine, it's like, it's like you think it's like a backwards game, you know? They're going to beat their enemies, they're going to come home and go, I guess I'm doing everything right. But that's, that's how great Shalom is. Hashem even would, would in, so to speak, so to speak, Shalom, it's like an enabler. The Jews are going to think like, okay, everything's okay. If we won at war, no casualties, obviously everything's fine. Which was what was happening. But that shows the great power of Shalom. 
That even with all of that, Hashem rather the Jews have peace, the Jews have shalom. How can we compare this? Quite simple, really. If you think of it like this, it'll be very easy to understand. Nobody has, ha- ha- has children. But Bezrat Hashem, you will all have children of your own. Amen. And when you do, you will see how much it hurts when your kids can't get along. It's one of the most painful things to experience. Painful. Even if it's over petty things, it drives you crazy. You'll do anything to make sure your kids get along. As they get older, the fights become more serious, it becomes even more painful. Parents cannot stand it when their kids don't get along. They'll do whatever it takes for their kids to get along. That's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu feels. Hashem says, forget about me. You want to worship me? You don't want to worship me? Okay, that's a problem. We have a problem. We definitely have an issue. We definitely have a problem. Yes, you're worshiping a dollar bill. That's not me. <laughs> but it's a problem. We'll take care of another one. But right now, because you guys are getting along, I love you so much. It's so nice. It's beautiful. I can, I can oversee all the others. I can, I can just ignore all the other stuff because at least you're getting along. That's the power of shalom. Lamad numize. So he says, we learn from this. Listen to this. He's bringing out an, a, a very, very important factor here. He says, so what is the greatness of shalom? Shalom has a, 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 an aspect to it where the satan has no jurisdiction where there is shalom. No jurisdiction whatsoever. The Yetzar Hara has no place where there is shalom. There is no permission for any mazik, any harmful, negative powers. Have no negative and harmful powers in the negative realms have no permission to enter a, 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 a place that has shalom. And believe me, the world is filled with mazikim. The world is filled with these damaging energies that are out there. There are damaging angels and different metatregim. There are, there are these powers that we, we build with our averot, with our sins. And these powers are the entities that are able to chas shalom, God forbid, cause damage. So he's saying when there is shalom, these metatregim have no power. They're powerless. They cannot enter where there is shalom. One second. Ve'at shit kayem until it becomes so powerful until the words of Yeshaya is has come true. Which is what? Bila mavet la netzach lo yizke haolam lehanod ma shalom hamiti. Until the words of bila mavet la netzach, which basically means death, completely leaves the world forever. Which is something that we say to people that are mourning in the seven days of mourning. That's what uh, that's what the rabbis read for them. Bilam mavad la netzach. May we see the day that death completely leaves the world. That's the day we're waiting for. That's what's going to happen. Eventually, there will be no more death. That is the optimal time of shalom. When shalom reaches that point. In time where there is no more death. That is the greatest, greatest, greatest level of shalom. Belachen. Therefore, because we know that such a thing exists, and there is levels to shalom, and we know such a thing exists as the optimal shalom where there is no more death and everything just everything runs like clockwork the way it was supposed to be. Lachen, therefore. Anu mitpalelim bechol yom. Every day we pray letikun haolam for the world's um, what rectification. rectification. He's got the word this time. We pray for the world's rectification, for the world's perfection. Belizakot baze hashalom, and to be. To merit this shalom. And every day, 
כל תפילה ותפילה, every single תפילה, מתתקן העולם מעט מעט. Every single time we daven, we say, Oseh Shalom Imurmav. Sim Shalom Tova Obracha. Every time the Kohanim go up there and they finish their bracha with Shalom. Every single tefillah, little by little we are being metaken the world to bring this optimal final Shalom. Ad bo yom ha-Yeshua, until the day of freedom, the salvation, until the day Moshiach comes. That's what we pray for every day. That's what we want. That's what all the tefillot are for. Meaning, every single day that we see our friends and we say shalom, that's what we're praying for. When the tefillot, when the Midrash says, when you see someone come from a journey, you ask them, was it in shalom? That's what you're praying for. I'm hoping that it was in shalom so that the optimal shalom will also come. Aval. But, ha-shalom shenintan lefinhas haya shalom ha-amiti. However, the shalom that was given to Pinchas was the optimal form of shalom. It was the main one. He got it early. He chipped in his tickets. How do you say? He cashed in his chips. Chipped in his tickets. <laughs> yesterday, I'm just gonna, yesterday was a fast day. I'm still recuperating. Okay? He cashed in his chips early and he got the optimal shalom. How? Even the malach amavet, even the angel of death had no permission to even come close to him. For him, death escaped him forever. That's what happened for Pinahas. Pinchas no longer needs to pray for shalom. Because he already received it. But we need to continue and pray for that shalom. So therefore, what we're saying is, what the Zerah Shinshon says, So therefore, what he's answering is, how we asked the question in the beginning was like this. We say like this. We said... How come the Midrash says, you know, the shalom that Pinchas got was great. And therefore, every time we see someone come from a journey, we say, a shalom ye yellow, was it peaceful? May you have peace. Every time someone wakes up, right, we say shalom. Why? Because he could have not woken up. He experienced death. So we, again, we're praying for shalom for that person. And so on and so forth. So he's saying it's two separate things. We asked, why are we saying, the shalom that Pinchas got was great. So you're saying it was different. And then we say, therefore, we say shalom to everybody that comes from a journey. So which one was it? Was his greater or, or are we, is, is all of it the same? So he's saying it was different. Everybody else when we're talking to them and all the tefillot, that's our tefillot asking Hashem to bring us closer to that shalom. Which shalom are we referring to? The Midrash says, Hashalom, the shalom that Pinchas got. That's what we're praying for every day. Hashem, bring that shalom that you gave to Pinahas for the rest of us. Interestingly now, we have through tradition, the Chachamim tell us, who is Pinhas? Later on, who does Pinhas become? Eliyahu Hanavi. He became a Kohen, right? And he became Eliyahu Hanavi. Who brings the final redemption of Shalom? Eliyahu Hanavi. So it all goes hand in hand. 
The person who acquired the true shalom is the one that is responsible in bringing in that shalom and announcing the coming of Moshiach Tzidkenu Bimhiravi Amenu Amen. It's incredible. It's incredible. The shalom that, that Pinachas got is the shalom that we are waiting for every single day. We pray, Sim shalom, tova uvracha. What are we asking? Every day we're bringing that shalom closer. But the Midrash says, but the shalom, shalom, the shalom that Pinchas got was that optimal one. No more death. No more, no more megatregim. What does that say for us? How many, how many people do we have in our lives where we have friction with? How many times do people say things to us that cause us heart heartache or causes problems and we, we get into it with them and we decide, you know what? Eh, the heck with that guy. According to this, if we don't want, if we want to live a life that no mazikim, no meratregim, you have to understand, tefilot, it says that our tefilot gets stopped at a certain level and not reach Shamayim because of these Megatregim, because of these, these stoppers, these negative forces that stop our tefillot. That's why we end the tefillah with Sim Shalom. We keep saying Shalom because Shalom is what gets rid of these Megatregim and allows our tefillot to go up. Imagine every day that we have strifes with different people, how much positive energy, how much positivity we are withholding from ourselves because of the lack of Shalom. And imagine vice versa. How much greatness we bring in our lives if we choose shalom. When we have problems with our friends, with our family members, if we become the ones that say, you know what? Okay. Have you ever tried that? Tried it's very, it's very, it's like, you feel relieved. Do it, do it with me like, okay. Yeah, you see? Oh, you got to be like, okay, he said this or she said that. She got a bigger wedding than mine. Okay. <laughs> I don't have to have my wedding on a plane in the air. Okay. <laughs> you just let it go and you make shalom with someone that you know, you, you, you to yourself, you know a thousand percent you are right. Thousand percent. You're Moshe Rabbeinu. Why would you be wrong? Why would you ever be wrong? I, we're never wrong, right? Or have we ever, anyone in this room ever been wrong? No. No. We've never, me included, we've never been wrong. But because we know we're never wrong, we should be the bigger people. And when there is, when there is an argument, when there is a problem, when there is strife, make shalom. And when you make shalom, just think to yourself, how much of briut, hatzlacha, refuah shalema you're bringing into the world. You're bringing that shalom that much closer. As the Zerash Mishon says, me'at, me'at, you're bringing it closer. When you bring shalom, imagine all the negative forces have no power over you. That's what he said. Me'at regim have no jurisdiction where there is shalom. Whenever you make shalom, Imagine you're, you, you literally just got a taste of heaven on earth. There's no, there's, there's, there's no other way of looking at it. If, if, the, if, if the Chachamim tell us that the power of Shalom is so strong that you could be, you could be worshipping idols and when you, have, when you have Shalom, they would go to war, no one could touch them. At war, and this is not long distance war, air force and stuff. This was hand to hand battle. Thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people fighting hundreds of thousands of people. And not one Jew would drop. How? It says because of Shalom. Because they had Shalom with each other. Do you know what it means to have that kind of power, to harness that kind of power? That's all through not saying Lashon Hara is number one. You want shalom? Number one is not saying Lashon Hara. And every single time we're about to say Lashon Hara and we stop, as difficult that is, as it is, imagine you're, bring, you're bringing that shefa of shalom into the world. 
You know how much the Chavetz Chaim says, imagine every single time you're about to say that juicy thing and you hold yourself back, you are literally gaining yourself Gan Eden. It's Gan Eden. It's, it's difficult. We all, we've all experienced it. Not that anyone in this room has ever thought about saying Lashon Hara, Has Shalom, including Has I'm just saying. If it ever occurred to us to say Lashon Hara, and we said, you know what? Beband. Chelos, lock it, forget about it. Right? What the Chachamim tell us is you're bringing Shalom into the world. And I just want to add something. Many people do, don't know. This was in my Lashon Hara series that I did a few minutes a day. Saying Lashon Hara about children is also Lashon Hara. Right? Walking around going, oh, you know that kid in the kids program, and I, in the shul's kids program, is the troublemaking, stupid kid. That's Lashon Hara, 100%, no difference. This is not like airlines where you pay less for children. Okay? <laughs> Lashon Hara for a child under 12 or under 2, Cost the same. So if you're going to say Lashon Hara, say that about an adult, because like, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's, it's the same. So sometimes we think like, oh, Bache, you know, this, this, kid's, this guy's kid is such a troublemaker. This is especially for teachers and those that are in, in, in outreach and stuff. A lot of times, teachers have to be very, very careful. And they talk to other parents about other kids. It's Lashon Hara. You have to have so many different requirements to meet before you say two words about another kid. Even about the person's own kid. Parents about their own children. It could be Lashon Hara. These are the things that are Meqatregim. These things cause problems. And they stop the Shefa from coming down. Because it, 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 what it's doing is in the Olamota Elyon, it's stopping shalom. If we want shalom, again for the thousandth time, we, we, we fasted yesterday. Shiva Asar Batamuz. And Bezrat Hashem, we're going to the Chag of Tisha B'Av soon. We need beer Yom Tov in our days, Bezrat Hashem. Why did it all happen? Why are we fasting again? Because of, because of the same thing. Sinat Chinam of Lashon Hara. That's, that's, that's it. And it works by, by us, each and every single one of us has the power to bring shalom into the world. It's not the next person. I've said this many times, I'll say it again. Please, please, let's do it for ourselves. Set a time. Don't not say Lashon Hara. I mean, if you want, say, don't say Lashon Hara all day. But I'm saying, if you, if you think it's too difficult, pick two hours a day. Two hours a day that, that you're awake. You can't pick it in the morning. <laughs> Like, okay, from 4 a.m. to 8, I do 4 hours, to 8 a.m., because I have to dive in Shacharit 8.15, 8 a.m., no Lashon Hara. No, it has to be when you're awake. Pick two hours a day, put it on your phone. You use these calendars for the stupidest, myself, we use these calendars for the stupidest things. Let's use it for one thing that actually counts. Let's put it on our calendars, two hours a day, no Lashon Hara zone. And you are permitted even if you want. I'm not permitting this, okay? Don't be like Rabbi Sakai told me. I'm just saying, somebody calls you, has some juicy, juicy news, or you have some juicy news, if it's in that time, be like, listen, I'm in my two hour zone right now, I'll call you in two hours. <laughs> really? Take it from me, trust me, because you know why? In two hours you'll regret it, you won't do it anyway. That's how the Satan is. When it's postponed, when you hit the snooze on the Satan, most of the, nine out of ten times won't come back. That's how it works. So just be like, two hours. Not two hours, one hour. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. This is how we will bring Moshiach. This is how we will do it. Hashem doesn't want, you know, tzitkut. Hashem doesn't want us to become tzaddikim overnight. Every little bit counts. Be like one hour, two hours. Let's do two hours. Two hours a day of la, no Lashon Hara. Please try it. Please try it. And you'll see. And come and tell me how it feels. Two hours, but every, same hours every day. Don't, 
That moment you get like that phone call, don't be like, I'm switch one second, let me switch my hours from two to three, two to four, from four to six. What did she say? <laughs> you can't do that, okay? It has to be the same two hours every single day. <laughs> we'll do that one more time for the men. Okay. But I said, what did he say? Okay. Better. All right. Wonderful. There, we don't have safe rooms in our shul. Melachen amar midrash. Therefore, the midrash says, "Bedin hu sheitol sacharo." Pinahas deserved to receive this sachar, to receive this um, reward. Says because listen to this. Kishat Sadikim Mevakshim Leshev Beshalva. It's brought down when Sadikim wanna when Yaakov Avinu, you know, wanted to finally he was over with Esav and everything was done. He wanted to settle down. Parashat Vayeshev. Right? Parashat Vayeshev, it says Yaakov Avinu finally was over with Esav, his wicked brother, and da, wanted to settle down with his children. What happened? Yosef was stolen, and the whole story of Yosef starts. What did the Mepharshim say? The, the commentaries? When a tzaddik wants to relax, Hashem says, what? You want to relax in this world? You have a lot of time to relax up there. I'll give you something to work you up. We'll not get into why Yaakov Avinu have deserved it, or we're not going to get into that. It says, when tzaddikim, mevakshim l'shev b'shalva, they want to live in tranquility, they want to sit, midat hadin miratreg alehem. The, the attribute of judgment causes problems for them. Megatreg, it starts to cause trouble. And Hashem and Akadosh Baruch Hu looks at every little needle hole of a problem when it comes to tzaddikim. Oh yeah, you want to rest right now? Oh yeah, you want to uh, you want to relax? All right, let me look back. See, 25 years ago, 35 years ago, what did you say about that person? I just remembered. You know what? Maybe you shouldn't relax so much right now. When it comes to the righteous, that's how Kadosh Baruch Hu deals. Avahal. But, Khan be Pinchas, Shedachat as Satan, when Pinchas did what he did and he pushed away the Satan, Heshivet Hamatim al Bene Israel, he completely took my anger, my wrath from Bene Israel, Bedinhu, then he deserves, which means what? Kelomar, Malachra, Yane Amen Ban Korcho. The negative angels, the wicked angels will answer Amen, even if they don't want to, which means what? Pinchas, with what he did, got Shalom in a way that that Shalva, that peace that Sadiqim want, and sometimes they don't get, Pinchas got it. Why? Because he brought Shalom. Now let me explain, what was it that Pinchas did that deserved this reward? According to some Farshim. What was it? <laughs> this was a great reward. Eternal life, no megatregim, perfection. Literally perfection. He received perfection. What did he do? So Chachamim tell us that he received shalom because he brought shalom in the hardest way possible. Why? Because he killed two people. He didn't do something dandy here. It was a very difficult, very, very, very difficult decision to make. How does someone kill someone? Especially Pinchas. Who he, he had in his blood to become a Kohen. That's why Hashem chose him and made him a Kohen. How could such a big thing happen? But he did it. When he saw that Hashem's name was being trampled upon, he did the hardest thing imaginable and he killed two people. In front of everyone. And he risked his own life because the Jews were about to kill him for it. So Hashem said, that kind of a person that sacrifices everything to bring shalom between me and my Bnei Israel deserves at periti shalom, will get my covenant of shalom. Which shalom? The optimal shalom. Because without him, Jews were dying left and right. 
Where else do we see such a thing? Shalom brings eternity. Shalom is eternal. We see this here, that shalom, the gift of shalom is eternal. It's eternity. How do we bring this home? Where else do we see it? Pinchas becomes a Anavi. Through the story of Ahab. Through the story of Ahab, yes. More than that. You know something crazy? We know that David Amelech wanted to build Beit HaMikdash. He wasn't Zohetu, unfortunately. <clears throat> and it says that, Hashem says to David HaMelech, when he wants to build the temple, you can't build the temple. I, David HaMelech says, I mean, everything I did was in order for me to build a temple. Like, it's quite frankly, it's not fair. Like, I've done everything in my power to be able to build a temple. David HaMelech, people don't know the full story and the history of David HaMelech. You should read it, please. It's our history. But like David HaMelech was the one who united Yerushalayim. Before David HaMelech, there was no Yerushalayim, the capital of Israel. Right? There was the Shevatim, everybody was their own Shevet. David HaMelech brought a, a, a mamash, a capital. He named it the capital. He brought all the Shevatim into one place. And he, and he formed Harabayit, the mountain. And he started the digging on the mountain for the Beit HaMikdash. And Hashem says, sorry. Can't build the Beit HaMikdash. Why? Now the answer that Hashem says to him is very cryptic. He says, because you've spilled too much blood in your wars, you, can't, you cannot build the, build the temple, Beit HaMikdash. Now imagine you were David HaMelech. What do you say? What do you answer to that? Hashem says to you, you spilled too much blood, I cannot let you build my Beit HaMikdash, my temple. What do you answer to that? Be, be frank, be honest. What would you say? And you, now you have nothing to say, Gabi. He went to war. He told him to go to war. What? Hashem told him to go to war. Hashem told him to go to war. He's like, now you tell me. You should have told me then. I wouldn't have gone to war for you. I wouldn't have fought any wars. No, bl- no blood spilled. I would have built a temple. After you've ordered me to go to war and unite your own nation, now you tell me because I went to war for you, I can't build a temple? Damn it. That makes no sense. Like, why would you do that? Why, why, why would that be a problem? I... This bothered me so much. It always bothered me. I understood it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not one of those that like, you know what? This bothers me. I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> you know? It's like I learned from one of my rabbeim. One time he said something to me that really stuck with me for life. One time I was learning a piece of Gemara in class. And those that learn Gemara know that it gets very difficult. And this piece of Gemara got very difficult. And I literally, I, I don't remember if I pushed it or closed my Gemara, I'm like, this makes no sense. And I just like, I was like, makes no sense. It happens. We all have our dark moments. <laughs> I'm a redhead. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, this makes no sense. My Rebbe, I never forget, he was also a redhead, by the way. Ah... <laughs> He comes up to me, I'm sitting here, he comes right up to my desk, and he says, just because you don't understand something, it doesn't mean it doesn't make sense. Next time, just say, I don't understand it. I don't have the capacity to understand it. But to say it doesn't make sense, it's a big blow. It really stuck with me. Sometimes we don't understand something. That doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense. This bothered me a lot. Why was David Amelech punished, so to speak? Until I found this shot, it is beautiful. It was like Hashem literally sent it for me. It says, Hashem never said that because you spilled blood and because of that you're punished and you can't build a temple. He just says, you fought worse for me, you spilled blood, you cannot build a temple. And David HaMelech doesn't really fight back that much. So what gives? The answer is follows. Hashem told David HaMelech like this, look, by you fighting all those wars, and spilling the blood that you did, which was for me, and uniting the nation of Am Yisrael, 
What did you bring in for me? You brought shalom. You were one king that finally brought the shalom that I wanted on my land. You brought it. Because you brought that shalom through the spilling of the blood and the wars that you had to do because I asked you to, if you build the Beit HaMikdash, it's not going to bring eternal shalom because it will never be destroyed. I can't destroy it. And if I can't destroy it, chas shalom, when Bnei Israel sin, which I know they will sin, I have to punish them, and that's the opposite of shalom. So in order for me to maintain shalom, I cannot allow you to build the Beit HaMikdash. Because if you build the Beit HaMikdash, it will last forever. He, sp- he spilled blood for Hashem and brought shalom into Eretz Yisrael through the wars that he fought. And the Beit HaMikdash would never be destroyed if David HaMelech would build it. Now, David HaMelech did still ask and said, I, but I, I, I should get something here. right?" So how do we know that if David HaMelech would have built the Beit HaMikdash, it would have never been destroyed? Who built the Kotel HaMaravi? David HaMelech. Hashem told David HaMelech, I'll give you one thing. You build one wall. I'll give you one wall. You build one wall. David HaMelech builds the Kotel HaMaravi, the western wall. Lasts forever. There's been two temples. Wars. Takeovers. How many nations have lived in Eretz Israel? Many. One wall still stands. It's got to freak you out. It's David's wall. That's David HaMelech's wall. How he built it, it's a different story for another time. But David HaMelech brought shalom, built one wall, and it became eternal. Because he... The wall? Yes. That's why it didn't fall? Yes, yes. That's why it became the wall of eternity. And the third Beit HaMikdash, Bezrat Hashem, is going to be built around that same wall. Moshe Rabbeinu. Every time Bnei Israel sinned, he would fight for Bnei Israel and not let Hakadosh Baruch Hu punish them. He brought shalom constantly between Hashem and Bnei Israel. Therefore, Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, "If I let you into Eretz Israel, you're going to have to build the Beit Hamikdash. And if you build the Beit Hamikdash, I will never destroy it because you are shalom. You brought shalom. And according to many people, and according to Chachamim, we don't know where Moshe Rabbeinu is buried." So that is in the air also. Where is Moshe Rabbeinu? We don't really know. That is the koah of shalom. It's eternity. Someone asks you, do you want eternity? Do you want to live forever? You want the, the, the world to survive forever? You want Moshiach to come? The next time someone says something bad to you, don't say anything. The next time you're about to say something bad to somebody else or about someone else, don't say it. And think to yourself, you know what? I just brought shalom into the world. No megatregim, no negative energies, nothing can touch me right now. If a wall is indestructible, you know it says that at, uh, 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 when the Romans took over Eretz Israel and they destroyed the second temple, the emperor comes and he sees this wall. right? And he calls this general and he says, I, I thought I told you I want it all in the ground. He turns to him and he says, Well, your honor, I thought about you. I said, if I destroy the last remnant of this temple, no one's going to know how great it was. I felt, leave one wall. So when people come in history and see, they'll be like, wow, look at this wall. I wonder how great the rest of the building was that the Romans destroyed. It only shows our power. He says, oh, brilliant. Leave the wall. Really? And throughout history, every single nation that took over Israel had a different excuse why not to destroy this wall. Everything else was destroyed, everything else was moved, everything else. This one wall stays. It's crazy. If you don't believe in God, and if you don't believe in Nevoah, if you don't believe in prophecy, you're crazy. 
And it's all the power of shalom. We see that what, what shalom does for us. And this is what we have to fight for all the time, to bring shalom. We pray for it every single day, in every single tefillah, we say something about shalom. It's time that we act upon it in our daily lives, when we speak, when we interact with other people. Just think, I want to bring shalom. And we'll end off with this. Say shalom in Rumab. Amen. Amen.